So it is my pleasure at this time to, in, to welcome and introduce to you the speaker for this morning, Pastor Wade Rose, in the name of the Lord. Thank you, sir. I'm a very good person. We got a good extra move. I'm a very good person. Pastor Wade Rose. Oh, no, no. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It is in the name of the Lord that I come. And I want to thank you for receiving me. I want to thank you for praying for my travels. I had two misses in, in flights, but I made it. And I believe I made it because God wants me to be here. <laughs> I know why we're here today. We're here because we love the church. We're here because we love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we cannot separate our love for Christ with our love for the church. The songwriter says the church is one foundation. Is Jesus Christ her Lord? Yes, She is his new creation. By water and the word. And any From heaven he came and sought her. To be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her. And for her life. He died. And so today what I want to do for a few minutes is to talk about the purpose of the church. There have been various presentations about the vibrant 21st century church. Different presentations about the call to the various purposes. But today, what I want to do for a few minutes is to address the question why do we even need these purposes? Why, being, why be purpose driven in the first place? And I want to begin with a quote. It's a quotation from one of my favorite Bible teachers. I want to give him credit. His name is Chip Ingram. And Chip Ingram says that the best seed in the best soil cannot grow in the wrong environment. Did you hear what I said? One more time. The best seed in the best soil cannot grow in the wrong environment. The Church of God Seventh Day has good seed. We would, I would say we have the best seed. And we may even have good soil. But a lot of us are lacking in the good, in the best environment. And it, it doesn't matter what kind of seed you have. And what kind of soil you have. You need to have the right ecosystem. And Chip Ingram says, 
that the ecosystem that we need in order to experience growth as the people of God is called authentic community. Two words, authentic, authenticity, to be real, the, the opposite of being a hypocrite, and community. In the word community, you hear the word come and unity. Community is a call to unity. Or we might say collective unity. And the picture of authentic community according to Chip Ingram is where, where the real you meets real needs in the right way for the right reasons. I want you to think about what I just said. And to help you, let me let me turn that statement around. If authentic community is where the real you meets real needs in the right way for the right reasons. Then unauthentic community is where a fake you tries to meet perceived needs in the wrong way for the wrong reason. I don't know how many of you are thinking about that statement and thinking about the church in your own country, your own conference, perhaps your own local church, where lots of people are meeting needs perceived needs. Sometimes they're not really needs. There are needs that they conjure up. And they do them in the wrong way. And they're wrongly motivated. And your church won't grow if that's what's happening. And so today what I want to suggest is that the way we grow is that we become what Pastor Rick Warren calls purpose driven. Pastor Rick Warren is the pastor of a very large church in California. He started the church, he was fresh out of college, Dallas Seminary. Now we're free Dallas College you move. And he said, I want to plant a very authentic church. And so he went knocking on doors. Because he particularly wanted to reach the unchurched. And he planted a church in Saddleback Valley, California. About 30 years ago. And today... He pastors a church of 30,000 members. And he, go ahead, amen, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And he wrote the story of the church in a book called The Purpose Driven Church. And 
And when I became president of the General Conference, and I began to pray and seek God's direction for leading the church forward, Rick Warren's book became the inspiration for the vision of the vibrant 21st century church that I had the uh, privilege of being part of casting in North America. And Rick Warren in his book makes several assertions that I want to call to your attention today. He says that we have myths about large churches. Let me mention three of them. A lot of us, and particularly in Church of God Seventh Day, and Africa is an exception, because here in Africa we have very large congregations. But even in North America, our largest congregation is 150 people. And Rick Warren says the first myth that we need to erase is that if it's large, if a church is large, it must be compromising the truth. We believe in the idea that small is good. Because Jesus said, fear not little flock. But we need to erase that myth. Rick Warren says that God not only called us to be faithful, he called us to be fruitful. And that's the second myth. The second myth is that we believe that we don't need to be large, we don't need to be, we don't need to be fruitful, we just need to be faithful. But Rick Warren says ministry must be must be both faithful and fruitful. Brothers and sisters, it is no accident that in the middle of our Bible, in the Psalms, the very first psalm, which is a picture of the fruitful life of the believer, it begins by saying, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now listen to what the next verse says. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. That bringeth forth its fruit in its season. Its leaves also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. To be a purpose-driven church is to be a church that prospers in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this presentation is a call not to the prosperity gospel but a call to be a fruitful people here's why here's why this is so important and I want you to consider very carefully with me 
Those of you who think that growth doesn't mean anything, please consider that we expect growth in all the other areas of our lives. Those of us who farm, if you plant a garden, what do you want? Church, what do you want? We want growth. Everybody say growth. If you plant a garden, you want it to grow. If you start a business, what do you want it to do? You want it to grow. If you start a family and you have children, what do you want your children to do? You want them to grow up. When my daughter was born, when my first child was born, I brought her to the congregation and I said, folks, here I have a bundle of joy. And I held my daughter up. And she puked right into my face. Puked. But, but I didn't mind it. It was pure. She was young. But if you have a daughter or a son, and they're 21 years old and they're still puking. You have a problem. If you have a child and she is 30 and 40 years old and still wearing diapers, you have a serious problem. And brothers and sisters, I am here today to say that we have churches 20 and 30 and 40 years old, some 50 and 60 years old, that are not growing up. And by the grace of God, I want to speak into your hearts a new era of life and growth and prosperity and it happens by being purpose driven so Rick Warren built his church around the idea of being a church driven by purpose and the five purposes that he crafted are based on the two great scriptures. You and I are students of the Bible. One of the blessings of being a part of the Church of God Seventh Day is that we are a people of the Word. Can you say amen to that? And in the Bible are the two great scriptures. They're great because they're called great. In the New Testament, we have the Great Commission. It's great because we have assigned the word great to it. And we call it great because it's the last thing that Jesus commissioned before he ascended. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and then teaching them to obey all things whatever I've commanded you that is the great scripture of the, of the New Testament but there is also a great scripture in the Old Testament and it's so great that it's developed a life of its own 
The Jewish people even gave it a name. It's called the Shema. And the Shema is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And the word Shema in Hebrew means hear. And the Shema begins by saying, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And in Matthew chapter 22, when Jesus quotes the Shema, he, he, he took the authority to add to it. You and I are not supposed to add to the Word of God. But Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. And therefore, He had the authority to add to the Shema. He took a verse from Deuteronomy, from, from the book of Numbers. And you shall and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So in Matthew 22, the command is to love the Lord your God with, with all your heart, soul, and mind. And your neighbor as yourself. Rick Warren looked at these two great scriptures. And he asked the question. And this is the question that you and I need to ask ourselves today. Are we as a church being totally committed to these two great scriptures? Are we loving God with all our heart, soul, and strength? Are we going into all the world, making disciples of all the nations? Are we bringing people into the fellowship? Are we making disciples of all the people that come to Christ? In our and the obvious answer is that we're not. And so Rick Warren says, the place to begin is to help our people understand what these two great scriptures actually mean. And so he broke them down into bite-sized pieces. Let's, let's do that very quickly. In fact, let me let me check. Are you all out there? You're tracking with me? The great scripture, the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. That is worship. The ultimate expression of love for God is worship. But then, not only did Jesus, you know, not only do we have what it says in the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, but Jesus adds in Matthew 22 to love your neighbor, and the ultimate expression of love for my neighbor is service. So in the great scripture in the Old Testament, the two purposes that we derive from that are worship and service. Let's look at the one in the New Testament, the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. The ultimate way, what that describes is evangelism. Baptizing them, that's bringing them into the fellowship of the body of Christ. So we have evangelism, we have fellowship, 
And then he says that you shall teach them all things that I have commanded you. So what we have here then are five purposes. We have worship, love the Lord your God with all your heart. We have service, love your neighbor as yourself. We have evangelism, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We have uh, fellowship, that's baptizing them and bringing them into the body. And then finally we have discipleship. Teach them all things that I have commanded. Brothers and sisters, let me just say this quickly. It is a sin to bring people to Christ, bring them into the church, and not grow them up in Christ. The church needs to have a proven tested strategy for growing believers in discipleship. And here we have five purposes. And they're taken from the two great scriptures of the Bible. And let me let me hold them up for you to see them before we you know, bring this to a conclusion. Let me let me hold these purposes up, and I'm I'm going to read for you uh, the way Rick Warren says them. These are the five M's of ministry. And, and the first word is magnify. We celebrate God's presence through worship. The second word is ministry. We demonstrate God's love through service. The third word is mission. We communicate God's word through evangelism. The fourth word is membership. We incorporate new believers into the fellowship. And the fifth word is maturity. We grow God's people through discipleship. Let me ask you, do you consider these things to be worthy of your efforts in your ministry, in your conference or country or local church? If you do, would you give a wave to the Lord today? Let me see your hands. Let's just wave. We need to be driven by these purposes. And as I began to reflect on them, it occurred to me that the vision of a vibrant 21st century church needs to not only reflect the things that we do such as worship and service and evangelism but it needs to reflect who we are as a people. It needs to reflect our history. It needs to reflect our theological journey. And so for that reason, we have not only the five purposes that I just described, but we have the five items that describe who we are as a church. Now, 
And some of these purposes are purposes that are not yet realized. But they're purposes for which we strive. We want to be a people who are Christ-centered. Because if Jesus Christ doesn't have his rightful place in the church, nothing else is in its place. We need to be a people who are spirit formed. Spirit formed. Because we can't grow the church, we can't do ministry on the energy of our flesh. In fact, let me correct myself. We can do ministry in the, in the energy of the flesh. The problem is it won't produce any results. A lot of us are doing ministry in the energy of the flesh. But I'm here in Ghana today to remind you that it is not by, not by might, it is not by power, it is by the Spirit of God, says the Lord. So we're Christ-centered, we're Spirit-formed, we're Sabbath-celebrating. We believe in our historic orientation to the seven-day Sabbath. And then we are a people who are Bible-based. We believe that the Word of God is the final authority that we have for faith and doctrine as a church. And then we added this one. Distinct yet inclusive. And that particular purpose was added as a reminder that the kingdom of God is bigger than the Church of God Seventh Day. That's a, that's a disappointment for some of you. Because some of us want to believe that the kingdom of God is the sum total of our church. And there is something about that that is attractive to me too. But I recognize by the grace of God as the Bible says many sheep I have that are not of this fold. And we will grow and we will prosper when we understand that God is bigger and wider and longer than anything that we can conceive. And so bringing those purposes together with the purposes based on the two great scriptures, we crafted a vision it is a vision of a vibrant 21st century church driven by these 10 purposes. So what do you do with that? Where do we go from here? What is the takeaway? Let me suggest a couple things. In order to be purpose driven, you need first of all to believe in the importance of being purpose driven. The word purpose has to do with meaning. It has to do with direction. It has to do with a cause. What is the cause? Purpose. 
We must be driven by purpose. And part of the reason why this is so important is because the world is hungry for purpose. Pastor Rick Warren, after he sold millions and millions of copies of that book, wrote a second book. The first book is called The Purpose Driven Church. His second book is called The Purpose Driven Life. Because in order to be a purpose driven church, we need to have people who are whose lives are purpose driven. And the purpose driven life became an instant bestseller among non-Christians. The purpose-driven life has sold more copies than any book written in the 20th century. And the reason it sold so many copies, I believe, is because the world is hungry for purpose. People need purpose. The American Centers for Disease Control has released a report that suicide among teenagers in America is the second highest cause of death. And there is a study that shows very definitively that the reason so many young people are taking their lives is because they have no purpose for living. Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, chapter one, the first line, God made you for a specific purpose. So you need to believe in the importance of purpose. Secondly, you need to craft a clear purpose statement for your church. All the pastors and conference leaders who are here, you need to go back home. This is a mandate. Go back home and cast a clear statement of purpose for your church. There are all kinds of statements that people write today in churches. There are purpose statements, mission statements, vision statements. A vision statement is a clear picture of the church you want to become. A mission statement is a clear understanding of the steps you're going to take to get there. But a purpose statement underscores why you exist in the first place. Go home and craft a clear purpose statement. And if you're a believer in Christ, and most of you are, or all of you are, craft for yourself a clear life purpose statement for your own life. Okay, so I'm winding up now. First of all, understand and believe in the importance of purpose. Secondly, craft a clear purpose statement. 
And thirdly, make that statement the driving force of your, your church. When you have a clear purpose in mind, when you know why you exist, if you keep on doing the same thing and you're not getting the results you want and you come to church week after week after week and you do the same thing and you sing the same songs and you go home and you come back for Wednesday night prayer meeting and you go home and you come back next Sabbath and 10 years down the road you're still the same and 20 years and 30 years to do the same thing and expect a different result is the definition of stupidity. And so what you're being asked to do is to be purpose driven and what we're asking you to do in this third this this third thing that I'm saying here today is to make the purpose statement that you craft the driving force behind everything that you do. In other words, as a church, think about your local church, whether it's in the United States or England, the UK, or Kenya or Nigeria or Ghana. Your local church can't do everything. You don't have enough people to do all the programs that need to be done. Which ones do you do? Which ones do you not do? There are some very good things that the church can do that the church should not be doing. Not because these things are not good, but because they're not a part of your vision. That's why there's another church down the road. Down the street. They do those things. Here at my church, we do these things. Because, because we pray. And because we ask God for a vision. And because he gave it to us. And we've crafted that into a statement. And now it gives us focus. Now it drives us. Now it tells us what to say no to. Now it tells us what to say yes to. When you write the annual budget, it is influenced by your purpose. Who you allow in your pulpit is driven by your purpose. There are some preachers who should not be allowed to preach in your pulpit. But when, you're, when your church is a thoroughfare, whatever, whatever we want to do, then every Tom, Dick, or Harry can come. But when you're driven by a purpose, when you're heading in a direction, when you have a firm aim in view, when you're taking dead aim based on a purpose, then you become selected. You become special. You become driven and you grow to the glory of God. Amen. 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 And so I want to conclude today by simply calling the church to purpose in, in a fresh way. 
in a new way. We are a church more than 150 years old. The Church of God Seventh Day began in Battle Creek, Michigan. Back in the mid 1800s. It came out of the Millerite movement. And its founder, Elder Gilbert Cranmer, was a member of a little grassroots organization called the Christian Connection. In that group were two people whose names we know well. Their names were Ellen and James White. James White, any Ellen? Ellen, Ellen G. White. And her husband James. And they were part of the same group called the Christian Connection. That Gilbert Cranmer, the founder of our church, was a part of. And as I travel around the world, people have asked me over and over. Pastor Rose, are we an offshoot of the Seventh day Adventist Church? Of course, most Adventists are convinced that we are an offshoot. Because, because for the Seventh day Adventists, they believe that the Seventh-day Adventist is the sum total of God's kingdom. And I don't say that disparagingly. I have great respect for the Seventh-day Adventist church. And many of us in Church of God Seventh Day have Adventist roots. I was born and raised in the Seventh-day Adventist church. But the point that I'm trying to make is that we're not an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Because even before the Seventh-day Adventist church was founded, while its founder, Ellen G. White, was still a part of the Christian connection, there was a separation because she began to have her visions. And a gentleman in the group, Gilbert Cranmer, began to object to her visions. And he was told that it's important to subscribe to the things that God is showing Mrs. White. And Gilbert Cranmer stood up in the meeting and he picked up his Bible and he said, my Bible and my Bible alone and he walked out of the meeting. And that led to the founding of the Church of God Seventh Day. So the Church of God Seventh Day was founded simultaneously with the Seventh Day Adventist Church. More than 150 years later, the Church of God Seventh Day is a church with a worldwide membership of about 200,000 people. A hundred and fifty years later, the Seventh Day Adventist Church is a church of twenty million people. We must remember to not compare. 
There are unhealthy comparisons. But today I hope that the comparison I'm making is a healthy one. When I look at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, hospitals and universities all over the world, Loma Linda University is one of the leading medical research centers in the United States. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is linking with other denominations, including the Catholic Church, in raising up medical centers all over the world. Several years ago, I was invited as a guest at their quadrennial convention. I was a guest of their world president. And I sat on the platform at the Superdome in Toronto, Canada. And there were 80,000 people at the convention. They paid the Blue Jays $5 million not to be there that week. A representative from the Vatican was on the platform. A representative, a representative from the White House was on the platform. The impact that they're making is unquestionable. I am not making this comparison for comparison's sake. I am making this comparison as a way of calling you and I to a greater purpose. And I am simply saying, let the church be the church. Let the church be the church. Driven by a purpose. Driven by a dream. I have a dream. It is a dream of a church that is a great church. Not because of its numbers, but because it is a force for good in the world. It is a church that does evangelism. A church engaged in witness. A church committed to discipleship. A worshiping community. A church that gives itself to service. It is a church making a difference in the world for the glory of God driven by the purposes that we have talked about today. Let the church be the church. Let us rise up Ah, yes, sorry. We don't need to compare ourselves to the Adventists. We're not, I'm not calling you to be the Adventist church. I am calling you to be the authentic church of God settled day. Where real people meet real needs in the right way for the right reasons. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.